Cool. Well, again, good morning. Uh, my name is Ty Whithelm, and um, welcome to the Hawaii Endemic Diver Course. So I guess first I should just uh, tell you a little bit uh, about myself. Um, I work with Konohonu divers as a scuba instructor and a boat captain there. Been there for a number of years. And I wrote this course about, I think it was about four years ago. Um, so I, I've taught it a number of times um, in the flesh, <laughs> uh, in person, but this is the first time uh, that I've taught it in this uh, format, so online. So it'll be, it'll be a fun uh, learning experience for, for all of us. All right, so <clears throat> let's see here. I mean, first, just uh, thank you for being here. Really uh, appreciate it and um, I feel honored actually to, to be able to teach this course to, to so many students. So uh, wonderful, thank you very much. Um, and hopefully when you know the world returns back to normal, uh, we'll be able to, to do some diving together. So wonderful. Let's see here. So first, I guess let's go over the course uh, format uh, before we actually get get into the class portion. Um, so here, uh, the course really is um, uh, is all taken from good old Hoover's ultimate book. Uh, so this may be a little bit of an older. Uh, version of it, I'm not sure. But anyway, if you have your, your Hoover's book with you, uh, definitely keep it handy, keep it close, okay? Peri uh, periodically, we'll be uh, going through, perhaps even reading from it too. We'll, we'll see how, how well that, that works. But uh, anyway, have the book handy. Okay, so what is a fish? Well, it needs to have three, three things. Uh, the first, it must have gills throughout its life. It has to have a backbone of some sort and a streamlined body with fins. So uh, any uh, creature uh, in the ocean that has those or in the water that has those three characteristics can be called a fish. Now, let's see a little quick question here. Is a manta ray a fish? So if you think a manta ray is a fish, raise your hand. All right, excellent. Okay, I'm seeing lots of raised hands, so wonderful. Yes, a manta ray, manta ray is a fish. It has gills throughout its life. It has a backbone, not made of bone, but of cartilage, and a streamlined body with fins. Uh, an interesting thing about manta rays is so it's pectoral fins here. Uh, it's pectoral fins uh, actually have evolved into more like uh, wing-like um, appendages. So manta ray's pec fins are actually its wings. It's kind of a cool little thing. Uh, so parts of the fish, here we go. Um, this is, uh, so the dorsal fin here, first and second dorsal fin, caudal fin or tail fin, same thing, anal fin, pelvic fin, pelvic fins are right underneath the pectoral fins, uh, gill covers here, chin barbels, if they have them, of course not all fish have those, and then the lateral line that runs uh, down the side of the fish. Now the lateral line is kind of an, an interesting organ that fish have, that we don't, uh, that allows them to sense just minute uh, changes in uh, water uh, directions, so little tiny vibrations in the water. They can sense those and then know which direction the current is going or which way the swell is pushing. Um, so anyway, kind of interesting little thing there. Okay, let's see. Also, a couple other things that, that aren't on here. Um, so the dorsal area, right, is, well, the dorsal's on there, but so this is the kind of the top side of the fish's dorsal. Underneath is the ventral uh, part of the fish. Um, anterior, it, it, so in front of the fish, the fish's head, 
uh, posterior back here behind the tail. Um, also, when we're identifying fish in uh, out in the wild, underwater, um, <clears throat> and it's not in here either, but there's a difference between bars. Bars go for vertically on the, the fish side like this, and then stripes tend to go horizontally down the side of a fish. So just uh, something to know for identifying fish in the, uh, out, in the, out in the wild. Okay. So a fact that uh, continually astonishes me is that fish are the oldest group of vertebrate animals on earth. So all vertebrate animals are descendants of ancient fish. So I think that that's uh, quite quite a fact. Um, and it's kind of cool for us as scuba divers when we're underwater, it's, it's kind of like peering back into um, the evolution of life, you know? So anyway, it's kind of a, a fun little thing there. Um, <clears throat> now on the course, I typically play a little video from uh, Sir David Attenborough um, in the, in one of his documentaries called Rise of Animals, Triumph of the Vertebrates. It's an excellent uh, documentary. Um, but in it, he explains that during the Cambrian explosion, which was about 500 million years ago, long time ago, um, there was an increase in uh, oxygen levels in the ocean and just created an explosion of, of life in the ocean. Um, and uh, one one of the things that came out of the Cambrian ex explosion was the first vertebrate fish, and its name is Milokunmingya. <laughs> kind of a difficult name there, but anyway, it was found in China uh, a number of years ago and has been dated back to about 500 million years uh, ago, so long time ago. It didn't have a backbone, you know, anything resembling like what we have, of course, but uh, they called it a noter cord. And it was just sort of a, um, a piece of, of cartilage that went along the dorsal uh, side of the, of the fish. So anyway, if you're interested, uh, that is a great little documentary to check out. Okay. Uh, all right. Oh, oh, here, I've got just a, a little question that I thought I'd throw out there. Let's, let's see how well this works. What are the, sci what's, are the scientists called that study fish? Uh, if you know, you can raise your hand. The first person that, that I see raise, okay, it looks like Carrie, raise your hand. Okay, so let me, well, actually, Carrie, can you unmute yourself? If, if not, no worries, Carrie. Is it an ichthyologist? Yes, very good. Ichthyologist. Excellent. Thanks, Carrie. Okay, so... Let's go ahead and continue. All right, so now we're getting into uh, environment and habitat uh, of our marine animals in Hawaii. Now the most common uh, reef in the main Hawaiian islands, at least, is the fringing reef. And a fringing reef is just simply coral structure that uh, grows and is built up along a coastline which is different from say a barrier reef in which there's something that uh, like a body of water or lagoon or something that separates <clears throat> the coral from, uh, from the coastline. So here uh, up in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, we do have um, coral caves and uh, um, some lagoons and things, but on the, in the main Hawaiian Islands, we're mainly uh, diving on fringing reefs. Okay. 
All right, so our different reef zones here. So the surge zone is, um, you know, zero to say 15 feet, something like that. And we see lots of surgeon fish, damselfish, blennies. Um, I think there's a question on there. An example of, a, of an algae eating uh, surge zone specialist. So um, any of those would, would work just great. <clears throat> On the shallow reef, so say 15 to 30, 35. Oh, okay, I have a question, Julie. Okay, Julie, did you have a question? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> it alerted me that, that uh, there was a question. I don't, I'm not sure what happened. Okay. All right. We'll continue. Okay. So the shallow reef, again, uh, 15, uh, 35 feet, something like that. We see Rass and triggerfish, butterflyfish, parrotfish, hawkfish, soldierfish, wine cleaner wrasse. And then as we get to the deeper reef, so 35 to say 55, 60 feet, we're looking for angelfish, wrasse, goatfish. Goatfish can also be in the shallow reef as well, of course. And then the drop off, so 55, 60 feet to 100 plus, we're looking for antheus, jacks, sharks, flame wrasse, things like that. Um, so, uh, so on the dives, when we actually go out and, and do the dives and look for endemic uh, marine life, we'll, we'll try and find endemic fish and identify behavior at, at all of these different zones. So sometimes we can't really get up into the surge zone, but on the shallow reef and the deep reef and, and then on the drop off as well. So on the, for the dives, we um, will need to identify at least five endemic species uh, per dive. All right, but often we can identify more than that. <clears throat> okay, so uh, now we're into classification and names. How do we classify these creatures here? So, um, Maybe some people remember from biology class <laughs> that mnemonic device, or that uh, mnemonic device, uh, King Philip came over for a good spaghetti or a good soup. So that is, of course, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. So here I have um, an example of the uh, Hawaiian garden eel, which is. Is the garden eel endemic or not endemic? Raise your hand if you think the garden eel is an endemic species, Hawaiian garden eel. Okay, awesome. Seeing lots of raised hands, beautiful. Very good. Yeah, so <clears throat> Hawaiian garden eels um, are only found here uh, in Hawaii and there are different, of course, different species of garden eels that are found all over the rest of the world, but our particular species is only found here. Okay, so <clears throat> the way I like to think about this is just kind of like an upside down triangle or pyramid. So at the top, we have, or the biggest category is the kingdom. So the garden eel is in animalia or the animal kingdom, of course. Phylum, uh, vertebrate, class, bony fish, order in the order of eels, in the family of conger slash garden eels, and then its genus and species name, or the binomial nomenclature, <laughs> is uh, Gorgasia hawaiensis. All right, so that's the particular species there. Uh, 
Now, and so in the book, and uh, when you look at any scientific um, uh, resources for species classification, it, it will look something like this. So it has the genus first, and the genus is always capitalized. And then the species, Hawaiiensis, is lowercase. And the names after are the researchers that first formally um, uh, identified it and cataloged it. And then the year is the year that it was done. So in 1979. All right. And so with a lot of uh, most of these scientific names, they have a, a Greek or Latin origin. In this case, it has a Greek origin. And Gorgasia is a derivation of Gorgons or the Medusa uh, character in ancient Greek mythology. So I think that's kind of an apt, uh, an apt name for the garden eels. All right. Okay, moving along. So now we're getting into isolation and endemism. So <clears throat> let's see here. So the sort of scientific consensus um, is that uh, most tropical marine life emerged from an area they call the center of dispersal, which was in the uh, uh, ancient seas of essentially Indonesia and the Philippines, so just south of the Philippines. Um, so all tropical marine life, it, it, from the best scientific evidence that we have, looks like that it uh, originated from from this area. Um, okay, now, so if we look at this map here, it's maybe kind of hard to see, but Hawaii is all the way out over here. So incredibly isolated. We are actually the, uh, the most isolated landmass um, on earth out here so uh, for uh, we're very we're far away essentially from the center uh, of dispersal so all of the marine life that that we have here in hawaii had to uh, cross these giant um, ocean distances uh, and make it here um, in order in order to make their home here so how in the world did they do that? Did they swim? Well, some of them, but mostly um, only fish with long larval stages uh, were able to survive those huge, uh, immense ocean distances from the center of dispersal to Hawaii. So here we have uh, an example of uh, a leptocephalus larva which is a, a type of eel, uh, basically. And um, so eel, I'm sure most people know that we have a lot of eels, a lot of different species of eels and more eels in Hawaii. And that, that's mainly due to the long uh, larval stages that they have. So their larval stage, can last uh, months or even as long as a year uh, or, or more. So they are drifting in the open ocean and have a lot of time uh, to drift into new, new areas. Okay. So again, isolation here. <clears throat> the Hawaiian Island archipelago stretches 1500 miles from Hawaii to the to Cure Atoll uh, up in the northwest up here. So this huge area is all uh, considered Hawaii. Looks like Sharon, Sharon has raised her hand. 
Let's see. Sorry, I think I accidentally just hit that. I'm actually carrying in dive gear um, over oh. here in California. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> no worries. Well, we're we're happy to uh, have you with us here. <laughs> okay. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Okay, so yes, Hawaii here again uh, uh, is the most isolated landmass on the planet. So the creatures that uh, that we have had to be extremely uh, hardy and have a long larval stage. So fish like the anemone fish or clownfish, for example, have a very short larval period, only about a week or so. And that's not long enough for them to be able to survive those big open ocean currents in order to get here. Therefore, no anemone fish here in Hawaii. Okay, finally, we've made it to endemism. So <clears throat> endemism is the occurrence of a unique species in a limited geographical area. So in, in this particular case, it's our area is Hawaii. And these species that we have, 25% of which are found nowhere else on planet Earth. So we don't have the same sort of uh, marine diversity as a lot of uh, other tropical places, say Indonesia, Philippine, Thai, or Thailand, or the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. Uh, however, we do have a, an extremely high rate of endemic fish uh, that are found nowhere else on Earth. So it's a great reason to come diving here. <laughs> All right. And so what is, what causes this endemism? Well, the main mechanism, of course, is this isolation. So isolation, well, how does it do it? Isolation encourages endemism because species populations are small, localized, and easily affected by genetic changes. Therefore, favorable mutations quickly become established the organism becomes better adapted to its environment and given enough time may evolve enough distinct characteristics to separate it from its ancestors. So, so there we have it right there. Okay. So a sister species, what is that? a very close evolutionary relative of an endemic species. So uh, an example of that here in the islands is our Indo-Pacific sergeant and our Hawaiian sergeant. <clears throat> the Indo-Pacific sergeant is found uh, in many places uh, in the ocean, but our Hawaiian sergeant is our endemic species. So as you can see, uh, they look very, very similar um, with the exception of the Indo-Pacific has the, this beautiful iridescent blue um, along its dorsal uh, caudal and uh, anal fin area right through here. And also the bars, the black bars that go um, uh, vertically down the body are much more pronounced in comparison to the Hawaiian sergeant. All right, now let's see how well this works. Uh, so for someone that ha has their um, John P. Hoover book uh, uh, ready and with them, if I could have a volunteer to read the difference be uh, between the biological species concept and the phylogenetic species concept. And that is found on page 69. So uh, if you would like, if you have your book and would like to read that, you can raise your hand and we'll unmute, unmute you. 
<laughs> and then you can read read that for the rest of us. Um, any, uh, anyone here? <laughs> oh, okay. Here we go. Okay. Let's see. Laura, I think that was, I think I saw, saw your hand go up there. So, all right. Looks like you've been unmuted. So whenever okay. you're ready yeah. okay um in 2007 karen marcus marsuka and kimberly payton confirmed that the endemic hawaiian sergeant and the immigrant indonesian pacific sergeant are interbreeding this could have big implications the traditional biological species concept holds that uh, geographical var variants from the same basic organism belong to the same species if they can interbreed and produce uh, live offspring, fertile offspring. Um, under this concept, the Hawaiian sergeant and the Indo-Pacific sergeant could represent a single species. However, the more recent phy phylogenic species concept holds that because geographical variants of the same basic organism have taken separate evolutionary paths, they are separate species, regardless of whether or not they can interbreed. Under this concept, the Hawaiian and Indo-Pacific sergeants are two species. Um, whichever side you're on, <laughs> mm -hmm. questions remain. Will the two remain distinct, produce, producing occasional hybrids, or will they merge completely? If they merge, will they create a new species? In that case, would um, abdominal, abdominalis be declared extinct? What might a new species look like? The, uh, if the above uh, right photo is any guide, the appearance of the two would blend about 50-50. Excellent. Laura, thank you very much for reading that. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, guys. Well, yeah, there you have it. It's, you know, it's interesting that um, <laughs> there's still a little bit of debate as far as how we um, uh, define uh, our, our species. So if we use the, the biological species concept, any that can uh, interbreed um, are... Uh, belong to the same basic species, but the phylogenetic concept uh, traces, uses DNA essentially and traces their evolutionary paths. So when you think of a species, it's, it seems like it, it would be pretty, pretty straightforward, you know, but it shows that there's, there's some blurry lines uh, that are still out there. So that's kind of an interesting thing. When we go diving out here, we'll definitely look for our Indo-Pacific sergeants and the Hawaiian sergeants, and then also our, <clears throat> the third time, um, the, our hybrid, which I don't have a picture of here. And you'll be able to see the differences between all, all three of them. Okay. All right. Again, Laura, thank you so much for reading. So what is <clears throat> a relic species? A relic species um, is an endemic species that doesn't have a sister species elsewhere uh, in the world. So an example of that is the masked angelfish here, which these are beautiful fish. I've never seen them um, in the wild, but I've seen them in an aquarium. But they're extremely rare, <clears throat> usually uh, much deeper and in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. Uh, they're more common. Um, but the 
So this is the last of its evolutionary line. Its sister species has disappeared, uh, or the, so the species that it evolved from or shares a common ancestor with has uh, gone extinct. Okay. All right. Our most abundant in, uh, endemic fish. Now I'm sure, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> if you have been diving in Hawaii, you've probably encountered both of these little guys. But our saddle wrasse up here on top, uh, also known as Hinalea lau willi, and I won't attempt the uh, scientific name underneath it there. Um, and then below that, our millet seed butterfly fish, or lau willi willi. Okay, so we tend to see lots of these guys. Okay, so moving on to our damsel fishes. So, and here, the way it's organized is on top, we have the, the family name here. So this is the common name on top. And then the scientific name is just below it there. <clears throat> and then underneath the picture, common name, Hawaiian name, scientific name. All right, now this one I've dubbed the dancer. Do we have another brave soul who would like to read about the dancer uh, from page 78 in your Hoover's book? You can raise your hand. Ben, all right. So it looks like I saw Ben raise his hand there. So Ben, it looks, I'm going to, let's see here. I'm going to have to promote you to a panelist uh, so that you can speak. I think you're using an older version of Zoom here. So uh, that's okay. Just after you're done, you can just uh, mute your microphone. That'll be good. Ben, you're talking to? Okay, okay Ben. Um. Sorry, yes, uh, I'm happy to read this. It says, Hawaiian Daxilis reproductive behavior is especially easy to observe. This is the area you want? Uh, yes. A male clears a nesting site on or near the bottom, then courts a female by bleaching his body bright white and performing a series of steps. Uh, rapid downward rushes while turned on the side. Dips are often accompanied by chirp-like sounds, easily heard by divers. If a female responds, he leads her to the nest where she lays tiny, transparent, almost invisible eggs, quivering as she does so. He follows close behind to fertilize them. This sequence occurs a number of times until all eggs are deposited. The female then leaves or is driven away, and the male defends and cares for the eggs often picking them up or aerating them with sideways flutters of his body. When chasing away other fish or divers, the male makes a popping or chirping sounds similar to those made while courting. More than one female may lay eggs in a single male's nest, but all eggs in a nest are laid on the same day and hatch in about four days. Most nesting takes place from May to August and spawning typically occurs in the morning. Spawning is synchronized uh, Dacillus is in a given area spawn on the same day at about six day intervals. Increases in water temperature stimulate increased spawning. A male at Molokini Inlet, uh, Maui, first noticed because of a distinct bite mark, defended the same nesting territory for nine years before disappearing. Excellent. Thanks, Ben. No problem. All right. Yeah, so, um, and in the, when we get together to do the dives, it's 
whole, it's fun to identify endemic uh, species, but it's what really is special, I, I think, is to um, witness some of their behavior underwater. So let's see a, a show of hands who has seen this type of behavior in the water. All right. Awesome. Cool. Lots of race hands there. Perfect. So, yeah. And the nesting is taking place May to August here. So um, hopefully when we can dive again, hopefully we'll be able to dive again soon. This is definitely something uh, that will, a behavior that we'll be able to encounter. <clears throat> All right, so also in the damselfish family, we have the farmer, so, uh, also known as the, <clears throat> the Hawaiian Gregory. And do we have a volunteer to read about the farmer? On page 81 there. All right, Carrie. Thank you, Ty. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, sounds great. The Hawaiian Gregory. This drab, blackish or brownish gray damselfish has bright lemon yellow eyes and often a patchy, unkempt appearance due to some scales being lighter than others. Common in Hawaii, it prefers areas with moderate to low wave activity and feeds primarily on filamentous algae. Each individual maintains an all-purpose territory containing shelter and a nesting site as well as food, which it boldly defends against all other algae-eating fishes. The territory extends about two to four feet in all directions from the center hole and is usually defined by a natural formation such as coral heads or clumps of weed containing more algae than surrounding areas. Those territories are occasionally discernible to humans. Like similar Indo-Pacific and Caribbean damsels, the Hawaiian Gregory farms its patch of filamentous algae by removing undesirable coralline algae. It also eats small invertebrates living in its algal farm. As that, anyone who has, is that it? Oh, is yeah. That there? Sure, that's, that's excellent. That's great. All right. Okay. <laughs> you want me to finish the next paragraph or are we good? Um, oh, that's okay. Um, I'm actually, let's see, I, I was going to take over, if we turn the page, um, or actually, um, you can continue reading if, if you'd like, uh, about the keystone species. The keystone species on the, on the subsequent page. Okay. Yes. The feisty Hawaiian Gregory is a surprisingly important member of the reef community, where it is abundant, the small fish can alter the local behavior of herbivores such as brown surgeon fish, convict tangs, and yellow tangs, forcing them to feed in schools instead of individually. Only schooling can the other, only by schooling can the other herbivores overwhelm the Gregory's defenses. It can also cause the four-spot butterfly fish to feed at night instead of during the day. More importantly, however, Hawaiian Gregory's increase both the biodiversity and algal productivity of the reef. Experiments off Oahu show that intense parrotfish and surgeon fish grazing per prevents some algal species from growing anywhere except within Pacific Gregory territories. Furthermore, these territories may be almost the only places where certain rare corals grow. Another study in Kanaohe Bay Oahu showed that young coral growth was highest on the windward edge of a patch of reef where the Hawaiian Gregory territories are most common. Finally, research on the closely related Pacific Gregory, okay, in Australia and Papua New Guinea showed that algal communities inside Pacific Gregory territories and those of similar damselfishes were up to 3.4 times more as productive as those outside. Organisms with a disproportionate influence on an ecosystem, such as those territorial damselfishes, are sometimes called keystone species. 
The removal often produces many unintended and unforeseen consequences. Excellent. Carrie, thank you so much for, for reading that for us there. Awesome. Yeah, so this little guy, the Hawaiian Gregory, is one that is very easy to overlook. <laughs> uh, it's not, you know, as colorful or as charismatic as um, many of the other fish, many of the other reef fish that, that we see normally. However, it really plays a very important role uh, on, the, on the reefs. So, and it's also interesting, it's once you, once you know about it and, and, and spot one, uh, you'll start to see them absolutely everywhere, <laughs> especially if the, if the reef that you're diving is healthy. Um, and it's, they're just really fun to watch because they will guard and protect their little algal farm um, and they really have quite an attitude about them. So anyway, uh, when we go diving, we'll definitely be looking for our farmers. Okay, here's another uh, endemic uh, fish, the oval chromis. So another one that, that we'll be looking for out there. Oh, I think I see a question. Oh, I, you know, so Dorothy has asked any evidence of the algae of the algae field is a re, uh, reproductive egg shelter like um, Southern California Garibaldi. Unfortunately, I I don't know the answer uh, to that question, but uh, we can. It's definitely something uh, that we could research there. So thanks. Dorothy, for your question. Okay. All right. Move. So now we've left um, the, the family of, of damsel fish and we're into the ras, ras family. The Hawaiian cleaner ras. Of course, this is an endemic species. There are cleaner ras all over. Um, the world, but this particular one evolved here. So this is always a, a treat to to find. And what they do, as I'm sure many people listening already know about, but we'll set up a cleaning station. So an area uh, in the reef where uh, other fish will swim by and they typically send the cleaner ass a, a, a a signal so they'll stick their pectoral fins out perhaps open up their mouth uh, and allow the cleaner ass to swim in and pick off any parasites that uh, is, are bugging the fish now these are actually that is a symbiotic relationship so a relationship in which uh, both species benefit however they are also considered a, a parasite as well, because oftentimes they will <clears throat> swim over and take little extra bits of mucous membrane <laughs> from the fish that they're cleaning. So, and sometimes you can watch this happen every so often, they will take a, a bite of the fish and um, the fish can feel it and then swims off quickly or sometimes even change, chases the wrasse a little bit. So in that case, they, that's more of a parasitic relationship. So uh, anywho. Oops, wrong way. <clears throat> okay, also in the ras family, this is one of my absolute favorite, the short nose ras looks a lot like the potter's angelfish, which is also a, a, an endemic um, creature as well. Uh, but the, these have a little bit of a different uh, um, uh, mouth shape here. And we'll, I'll show you a picture of potters and you'll be able to see how, how they differ. Um, but this is just a, a really beautiful little little creature that we'll look for on the dive. 
also, of course, we have the harem master, the psychedelic ras. I'm sure many of you have encountered this guy out there uh, in the water. Um, let's see here. Do we have uh, another volunteer that would like to read about the harem master here? Okay, okay. psychedelic grass. This is one of Hawaii's most distinctive endemic fishes. Males are brown with a splendid orange, blue, and yellow head. Females, dark brown with fine white spots, sport a red tail with a white bar at the base. Subadult females sometimes occur as shallow as 20 feet, but the spe spectacular males in their harems prefer somewhat deeper water. Females generally forage in a loose school of about a dozen, while a lone male harem master keeps watch from somewhere nearby. If they stray from his territory, he brings them back into line, swimming rapidly among them with his dorsal fin raised high and tail fin clamped shut, a posture similar to that adopted by terminal male saddle wrasses when patrolling their spawning territories. Psychedelic grasses are not abundant, and it is always a treat to see them, especially the males. Neither sex survives long in captivity. The species name means golden head. Look closely at the male, and you will see a gold patch on its head above the pectoral fin. When females change into males, this gold patch is the last male color feature to appear. Blennies. All right. So we've moved into a different <clears throat> fish family again here. Both of these uh, blennies, the Goslin's fang blenny and the Eva fang blenny, they look very similar, um, but they are two different species. And I like to call these ones the deceivers. And let's see, the Eva fang blenny and Goslin's fang blenny, both pictured above, so here. The males make sneak attacks on larger fish to feed on scales, skin, and mucus. They both benefit by their resemblance to the harmless juvenile Hawaiian cleaner wrasse, well, mostly harmless, <laughs> which approach larger fish to clean them. The Eva Fang Blenny, however, has an alternate color pattern of orange or reddish brown with narrow blue stripes that does not resemble that does not resemble the cleaner wrasse. And there's evidence that individuals can change from one pattern to the other at will. What advantage might more might the more conspicuous color pattern confer? Perhaps it serves as a warning coloration. If a predator tries to eat a fang blenny, the blenny bites the inside of its captor's mouth with special defense fangs on the lower jaw, thus the name fang blenny, and the predator usually spits it out. If the, fling, if the fang blenny is conspicuously colored, the predator is more likely to recognize it next time and leave it alone. <laughs> so these guys are, are really, uh, uh, really interesting to, to encounter. Um, and you can you can see them often they'll swim you know a couple feet above the seafloor and they attempt to mimic the same little motions and dance that the Hawaiian cleaner wrasse does and when a fish comes close they will swim right into them and take a, a big bite of mucus <laughs> membrane or fish scale uh, <clears throat> So that's kind of a fun, fun behavior to look for. All right. All right. Now we're into our angelfish family. The potter's angelfish, of course, one of just the most beautiful fish on the reef, in my opinion, I think. Um, and they can have quite a lot of color variation uh, as well. Um, if, if you look them up in the book, there on page four, they show some of the different uh, variations. Um, they can be uh, all blue, 
with um, black uh, black bars and, and black coloration uh, or a, a whole host of, of different colorations. So uh, very cool. If Also, if you have the book at, at the top, they show the difference between the male and female. They, they're almost always spotted together. So if you see uh, um, one or the other, look for the other one. <laughs> so the males are slightly larger. Um, they have a, a li usually a little bit more of that uh, blue coloration on, on its body and um, just a, a little bit of a, a, larger, a larger head is how I typically differentiate them when we're out there diving. So anyway, if you spot one, look for the other. All right. Another beautiful one, the bandit angelfish. Now we typically see these uh, on the on the deep reef. This is maybe the one of our favorite areas, uh, Pavai Bay, which is um, just north of Old Airport Beach in Kona is a great place to to find these guys, the banded angels. They're very beautiful. They have this this black band or stripe that goes that covers their eye. So you can't kind of you know kind of hides their their eye. And these are, are one of our larger angel fish. So they can get as big as say dinner plate size or something like that. And again, to, we've seen them, you know, usually 100 plus uh, depths of about 100, 100 plus, something like that. Uh, but they will, in Pavai Bay, sometimes they come up a little bit shallower. So um, they can come up to, say, 50, 45, 50 feet, something like that. Oops. <laughs> All right, now into the groupers and antheus family here. <clears throat> this one, the Hawaiian longfin antheus. I have not seen one of these for a number of years, but they are absolutely gorgeous. Um, we had a, a number of years ago, actually, at uh, Garden Eel Cove we had a pair that started as female. So they, they arrived as, as two females. And then um, these are like the, um, like the harem master, uh, the psychedelic grass, they can change sex. And, and usually it's the a change from uh, female to male. So the fish are, are born female and when the conditions are favorable, uh, they can change uh, into the male. So we watched these two uh, female long finantheus for, boy, uh, maybe a year or two. And then one changed sex and th then they became a mated pair. So there was a male and a female down about, oh, 60 feet or, or so off of the, uh, this, let's see, the south side of Garden Neal Cove. And uh, then the female disappeared and just the male hung out there for a number of months and then finally they both disappeared. But th that was the last sighting that, that I had had of, of the Hawaiian long finantheus. Just out of curiosity, anyone listening there, did anyone encounter those Hawaiian longfin antheus in Garden Eel Cove years ago? <laughs> okay, I've not seen any hands. All right. <laughs> well, yeah, they've been gone for a while. But a, a beautiful animal. And again, one of the deeper water fish. They're usually down, uh, you know, beyond, well, usually beyond 100 feet, really. Uh, it was kind of special that they were up at about, I'll say, 65, 70 feet in Garden Hill Cove. 
Okay. Now into our surgeon fish family and unicorn fish. Uh, the gold ring surgeon fish in Hawaiian, they're called kole and just named for the gold ring right around their eye there. <clears throat> we tend to see these up, you know, a little bit uh, on the shallow, shallow to, to deep reef, something like that, um, where the coral uh, is healthy. We, we tend to see our gold ring surgeon fish. Now into our butterfly fish. This one, the blue striped butterfly, one of my favorites. Uh, very rare uh, on the big island, at least. Uh, some of the other islands in some areas, they're, they're not quite as rare, but here they're, they're extremely rare. We've seen a number of them over the years at some of our dive sites. And uh, uh, like most butterfly fish, these will find a mate and and stay with that mate for at least most most of their lives so when you see one definitely look for look for the the second one this one here is this one's quite rare we call i called it the royal because it has such i don't know kind of a royal appearance i i guess um uh, but the hawaiian fantail filefish really beautiful one um, very rare haven't seen one of these in in quite some time but we uh we definitely will keep an eye out for them when we go diving all right now into our scorpion fish and coral crouchers so into this into these families the Hawaiian red lionfish, very beautiful. And again, so this uh, lionfish is uh, unique to Hawaii. Th this isn't the same species that are taking over in other parts of the world. Um, so we're extremely lucky if we see uh, the Hawaiian red lionfish or the uh, green lionfish. So these are, are both endemic species and a treat to encounter. Uh, and much, much smaller than many of the other lionfish that are found in other parts of the world where they can get up to, say, beach volleyball size. Well, maybe not beach volleyball size, volleyball size. Um, it, these get to oh, maybe uh, a, a huge green one would be, uh, say, a baseball size. And the largest I've ever seen on the, the red is probably a little bit smaller than that. So anyway, these are much smaller. Okay, so this one here, the coral croucher, this is a very easy one to, to overlook. Um, it, this fish doesn't have a swim bladder like some other fish um, that are out there. So it's not doing a lot of, a lot of swimming in, in, open, in open water there. It's mainly living down inside uh, coral. So the Hawaiian coral croucher only found here. Now this one, Actually, when I wrote the course, uh, the red stripe pipefish was considered endemic to Hawaii. But within the last couple of years, they've actually found um, found this species in other places. So this one is uh, no longer considered endemic to Hawaii, but still, you know, very special and, and a cool one that we look for. I call it the the daddy because. Um, it's in the same family as seahorses, and just like seahorses, the it's the the male that actually carries the eggs. So the female uh, deposits the eggs on the male. The male fertilizes the eggs, and then the male, um, uh, well, the eggs hatch off of the male. Uh, so it's kind of an interesting little fact about our. 
red striped pipe fish. And also, um, on many occasions, I've actually seen uh, the pipefish with little eggs uh, underneath it. So that, of course, is a super treat. Um, but uh, it's kind of a rare thing to see, but keep your fingers crossed. Okay, guys. Well, again, thank you very much uh, for joining me today. And um, stay healthy and, and safe. And uh, God, let's go. Let's go diving. Yeah. So let's get back in the water as soon as we can.